three days. At this point, I'm going to erase about TLB misses and this stuff, and I'm going to erase the multitasking. So now is when we actually get into system tuning because we've looked at the applications, we profiled the applications, and now we want to see what we can do on the system side. Now in IRIX, we have three types of file systems. In Linux, there's a bunch. In Linux, those are familiar with Linux, the EXT file system is your standard. But they're also using what's called the riser file system, which is a journal file system similar to XFS. And then you also have the ability of XFS file systems now, or you could even be mounting uh, FAT file systems and so forth. NTSS file systems. Now XFS has been around out in Linux for a while, but it hasn't been very stable. We're integrating it into our Linux 1.4, the ProPack 1.4. So XFS will be available on IRIX as well as, or on Linux as well as IRIX. However, when they're putting it on Linux, they're using a different type of volume manager to do concatenated volumes or to do volume sets. So they still have an XFS subsystem, but the volume manager they're using is something called uh, LVM, Logical Volume Manager. Okay, so there are two layers here. There's the XFS file system that manages things, and then there's the uh, Logical Volume Manager that's converting it from a logical address into the physical location out on the disk drives. And presently, with IRIX, we have the EFS file system, which is basically obsolete. EFS was really designed for workstation single drive situations. EFS is actually better on small workstation, lots of little file situations, because it was designed for a small workstation environment. The trouble is, as these file systems got bigger and bigger, EFS could no longer support and handle things. And one of the key things in XFS is something called journaling. Now, what is journaling for? XFS has journals, Riser has journals. What's the journal for? Recovery. Recovery of what? The dry notes. Correct. The journal is keeping track of my metadata changes, inodes and directory blocks. Prior to journaled file systems, what did we have to do? FSCK? Check, check the integrity of the whole drive. You had to traverse the entire file system tree. Now we've all seen the Unix picture of a file system tree, tree upside down. If I'm in the middle of changing an attribute to a file that's growing, shrinking, being created, or being removed, the inodes are in a transient state. If I take an interruption during that time, I suddenly have these structures that are not attached to my file system tree anymore. So in the older days, we'd have to go from left to right alphabetical through the entire file system tree and check the integrity of everything. Saudi Arabia Ramco take a half a day to boot their system and to check their huge file systems. So as the file systems got bigger and bigger, the work during boot of checking these things got worse and worse. And some of us have seen the error message when it can't figure out what to do with the inode, what does it say and what does it do? calls them an orphan. Oh, yes. And it asks you, do you want to put the orphan in lost and found? So that's the older way of doing things. Journal file systems are keeping track of all this I know changes. So now I have clues. Instead of going through the entire file system tree, I can start off with the log and say, here are the structures I was in the process of changing. And it allows me to quickly attach these orphaned inodes, instead of putting them in lost and found, put them back to where they belong. Okay. And if you worked on Windows, that's a fat file system by default. One of the advantages going to NTFS is that you've got better reliability, not of the data, but of where to find the data. 
okay? And that's the whole trick. The journaling is really not protecting the data, it's protecting the pointers to where the data is. Okay, I can still have bad data. I could lose a couple of sectors within my file. I, I could truncate or DD, do all kinds of messy things to the file. Uh, I could, uh, you know, mess up the file, and that's what backups are for and raids are for. That's what protects the file itself. So the only thing the journal is protecting is the file system tree and the metadata structures that point to where the file actually is. So as my file system got bigger and bigger, it got more and more work to go through the entire file system, especially if there were more inodes or more files. As, as the number of files got bigger and bigger, I had more metadata in my system, particularly, for example, an NFS server, where I've got all my users putting all their files in one place. So that is the biggest thing that XFS gave us. There are other things as well, but one of the key things was reliability of my metadata. So if I take an interruption, instead of finding the file in lost and found, I can find out where it goes. Now personally, I have a problem with my son messing up my PC at home with Windows 98, and you got scan disk that goes through the integrity of the file system to make sure everything's there. But in the process, he downloaded an MS-DOS file and that messed up the drive. By the way, I got a warning today from the vendor. They're going to shut me off because somebody on my system tried to hack into somebody else's system. Gee, guess who that was? <laughs> yeah, they're, well, I don't know. It's <laughs> either a Trojan on my system or somebody intentionally, because my son has three or four friends that come in, too. So I've got to go back and find out what's, what's going on with this disk drive. But the problem is, is, and this was the first time, he was used to Windows 3.1. Windows 3.1 was not a cached file system. So with 3.1, you could just turn off your PC and everything would be fine. With 98, there is a cache mechanism, just like MT. And if you're shutting down MT, you do the shutdown thing, and then it says, wait a minute, I'm flushing buffers off to disk. And then it says it's now safe to do a shutdown. So we're trying to protect to make sure all that metadata integrity has been pushed off to the disks. Well, my son, when we upgraded to Windows 98, just turned the thing off. And then when he turned it back on the next time, he says, oh, you didn't shut down properly. I'm going to have to check the integrity of your file system to make sure everything's there. And in fact, he had shut it down, still had stuff. He had created a user account for one of his friends. And the user account got lost and got moved into lost and found, so you had to go back and recreate that user account all over again. Or else, during the lost and found, try to move it back to where it goes. So every time I run scan disk, it keeps moving these files to lost and found. And suddenly I'm missing dynamic load libraries or all these little pieces that were in some transitional state when a power uh, shutdown occurred, either intentional or unintentional. So scan disk was what the older, like an FSCK, checking your file system. Anyway, we'll come back to XFS. We also have raw file systems, and that is, again, the kernel is not keeping track of where anything is. It is a character interface, typically used by the database market. And then we have the meta index. And the meta index is on the IRIX file system. It has an inode pointing to it and everything. But then all the items that I'm databasing don't have inodes, they're within the meta index. So when you build a database engine, the meta index is essentially inodes and directory information contained internal to the database engine. Now they do that, again I said yesterday, number one, I don't want to ask the kernel to do my work for me. Every time I go to the kernel, there's no guarantee that I come back or that it's going to do it on a timely fashion. So it's faster for Oracle to keep track of its own meta index. It can optimize it for what it needs to do, rather than asking the operating system to keep track of things. Send mail. There are sites out there that have send mail handling mail. If somebody spams the 200,000 users on this particular AOL system or something, and you get a million inodes that have to be created and destroyed. So there are applications and sites out there that are moving away from send mail and going into a database market or going into a, a Oracle to hold the email, so it brings it in. Instead of creating and destroying inodes, it's all internal to Oracle. And that's going to operate faster. Now, what's the advantage of a file system versus raw? Simply user-friendly. Okay. So with a 
raw partition, I don't know the name of the file. I can't say find the file that's my movie. Okay. But maybe I could write down and figure out this file, I know 101 or something like that, is off in this particular location on the drives. So the purpose of the file system is just to make it user friendly. But it's not fast. The fastest is going to be raw. So yesterday I also mentioned this. The slowest is going to be what's called blocked or cached. And that is using B copy, and that is using buff view and buffs. And that should be the buff lock that's controlling that type of I.O. This will be your slowest bandwidth, but it could be good latency. If I only need one or two items, the latency is going to be good because it's already in memory. But if I've got lots of things to bring in, I have to move the data through bcopy, and bcopy is going to restrict my bandwidth. Now in iRix, all your I.O. defaults this way. It's user friendly. The second type of I.O. I refer to as direct, or some people call raw. That was a Cray term. This bypasses buffer cache. So that's going to be faster. Better bandwidth. With B copy, I'm moving it from kernel buffers to user space, user space back to kernel buffers. Why shuffle it around? Okay, let's just get it straight into user space. When I open up the file, there's an O underscore direct that I can say, when I open it, bypass the buffer cache. And if I'm in Fortran, there's an assign command that allows me to tell the I.O. libraries to do the same sort of thing and I don't have to rewrite my application. So this is going to be faster when I've got better bandwidth for large data. And again, for lack of confusion, direct was a Fortran thing. In Fortran, direct I.O. was record referencing. Or random I.O. is another name for it. So in the Cray world, we never called it direct because a direct reference was a Fortran terminology to do direct I.O. To, to basically position directly to the record you want. So in the Cray world, we always called it O underscore raw, and the bit was an O underscore raw bit. The third type of I.O. is called character I.O. And SGI calls it raw I.O. as well. This is your fastest. And this is used by databases. There is the least amount of code between where my data sits and where I need it. Least amount of instructions in the kernel. I don't have to manage anything. I simply get the I.O. done. By the way, in the network areas, there is the ability of doing direct I.O. in the network area now. It goes direct, directly from the network interface card straight into the user space bypassing network buffers. Anybody know what that's called? STP, Scheduled Transfer Protocol. That's fairly new in the market. So with STP, if I have the situation where I'm moving data into my uh, user space from network cards with a lot of data, I can bypass the shuffling, reduce my system time that's managing the I.O. overhead, and go to what's called STP, or Scheduled Transfer Protocol. Now this is referring to disks, whereas this is referring to networks. So I'm just throwing that in right now. So when you order, for example, we've got gigabit ethernet dash ST, and when you get into Beowulf clustering and stuff like that, the interconnects, uh, Miranet, anybody that's heard of the Miranet drivers, they're coming straight off the network interface card, straight into user addressable space, bypassing all kernel interaction. That drops my system time, that drops my interrupt handler time, 
There's less code to manage the TCP stack, and it's going to operate faster. But that's only good when you're moving large amounts of data. So I'm just saying we've got cached I.O., we've got bypassing cache, and we've got character I.O. And this is through the, these two, by the way, have to be well formed. They have to be sectorized. In the Cray world, if I improperly set my array and it's not in a sector size, it pushes it through cache to sectorize it. In IRIX, it's fatal. If my array is not a 512 byte multiple and I try to do direct I.O., IRIX will call that a fatal error. Whereas in the Cray Unicos world, it would say, you don't know what you're doing, I'm going to shove it through cache to sectorize it for you. So it's ironic, in the SGI world, everything goes through cache to sectorize things, whereas in the gray world, we try to bypass cache as much as possible. And I've already talked about buff view showing me what's using that buffer cache. If it's good data, great. If it's bad data, I don't want to cache it. So anyways, the raw partition was being used by databases, and it's also being used by swap. Then going into our, our Disk drive, we've got a volume header, which basically describes what's on the disk drive. And then it's built out of, if it's EFS L volumes or XLBs, if it's an XFS volume. And what do we have new nowadays? What's the new type of partition type? For CXFS, what do they call it? XVM. There is a new volume manager replacing XLB. XLB will not be ported to Linux, but XVM will. So you can add a list down here now. There is an XVM partition as well. If you log into a CXFS system, HINB will actually show you the XVM label. It's visible with HINB. So eventually XVM will be replacing XLB. And logical volumes allows me to put drives together, multiple drives together, into a single file system. Whereas EFS and these things were just a single partition. And I couldn't grow my partitions like I can with a volume manager. So XLBs are the older logical volumes, which allows me to put the drives together in three different ways. Mirroring concatenating, and striping. Mirroring is just for reliability. There is a case where mirroring might be good for performance. There are sites that buy SSDs. Not a BHIS Cray SSD, but a SCSI solid state disk. So it's a SCSI interface to RAM. They call it an SSD or RAM disk or something like that. If I lose power, whatever's on that RAM disk gets lost. So I have seen sites that will mirror this RAM disk to a disk drive. And with mirroring, you get your I.O. done from the first plex that replies to you. So I can get a reply from the high-speed solid-state RAM disk, whatever you want to call the thing. And then the data that was on it would then get mirrored to the other plexes. That's the only reason that plexing might be useful in a performance situation, if you have different speed devices. Uh, the second way was concatenating, and concatenating was simply building a larger file system. And then the third way was striping. Concatenating is for capacity, striping is for bandwidth. And if I'm striping, I better be doing large I.O. Remember that Oracle situation? We saw 4K byte transfers and less. Striping is not going to be very good in that situation. You're doing lots of little I.O. The only time striping is good for you is when your request size is larger than the strike units of your drives. Remember I said earlier it's a 64K byte default strike size. So if I have four drives striped together, and I want my I.O. request to go in parallel to all four drives, it needs to be a 256 
k byte request size. So with par, I would be looking for 256 k byte requests. And this concerns me about Warren's machine too, because they've got striping, but I don't have enough par data to characterize the I.O. If they've got accounting data there, I can pick out my top I.O. commands and then check those commands to see are they doing small I.O. or large I.O. and figure out more about what the applications are actually doing. So I need to know what my record sizes are going to be like. Record size actually was probably a bad name. I should just say read write size. What's the size of the system call? So small I.O., large I.O., I should say, is designed for striping. Whether you're striping from mainframe IRIX or striping within a RAID cabinet. So I mentioned earlier, striping is for bandwidth. This does not improve your latency. So for example, in the video server with MediaBase, I'm going to put my meta index and all the stuff that Oracle needs on the file system in a low crossover drive that is non-striped to handle little I.O. And then my video media is large sequential I.O. And that one I would put on a real-time partition and then stripe that one. And I, I said an example early in the week where they 4K byte transfers, LS was slow, and then they went and found we were 8 wide and doing 4K byte transfers, and we were wasting the bandwidth of the drive. What bothers me is when you're striping, all the drives show the same SAR types of numbers. And when we looked at Warren's machine, all of them were coming in at 65 milliseconds on their wait times and stuff. And that was a good indication that they were being striped together. So the question would then be, what's the nature of the I.O. going to that file system? Naval Research Lab striped 128 disks wide. Their applications were doing 10 byte transfers. That's how you get a, a five minute or a 30 minute wait on an I.O. request. When you're striping, you're setting up a fat data pipe. So they went 128 wide, 64K byte per disk. So let's figure out what kind of request size that would be for. So I said 128 drives times, and I'm just using a rough number, 64,000. Gives me an eight meg request size. So if my I.O. operations, if my reads and writes within my application in PAR are showing 8 megabyte reads and writes, then that 128 wide file system was properly designed. But then when we looked at the data, SAR was showing disk drives that were sitting there waiting for minutes on an I.O. request, and we identified an application doing lots of I.O. and it was doing 8 byte transfers. 10 byte transfers, stuff like that. The nature of the data that they're databasing. Okay. And this was the same problem I had at NASA Goddard. One application came in and did lots of little IOs, but everything was designed for large sequential. So when we set up these file systems, we have to pick middle of the row. And then your job is to figure out, do I up the application or do I drop the file system? I've got to match the two. Okay. And that's why PAR is so important at this point. Because PAR in that SPV where I was plotting the request sizes, that information tells me, am I doing small I.O. or large I.O. and do I want striping or don't I? Now what I hate is everyone doing striping on home directories. It depends upon what you're doing in your home directory. My home directory has emails and stuff that are typically, you know, the whole file isn't more than a, a a bank at the most. Okay? So in home directories, you're usually doing lots of little I.O., the VIs and stuff like that. I pop up VI and write hello mom, 10 bytes. Can I spread that across 128 drives? No, I can't. I need at least 512 bytes just to get to one drive. So a lot of people will go RAID 5 on their home directories because it's a trade off between price and performance but they'd be better off going RAID 01, but it costs more disk space. Now, if that home directory was Disney and I'm doing movies, that's a different story, because movies are doing large sequential. And what we try to do at that point is split out our I.O. traffic. So if I've got a file system that is designed for large sequential, I'm doing lots of little I.O. in it, 
I want to create two file systems, one for little I.O., one for large I.O. So you start splitting out your file systems. Again, the bigger the system, the more I can abuse it. So if I put all my users into one file system, one person can come along, anybody can do a write of one byte at a time, and that person can then just trash that file system and everybody else feels the impact of it. So again, with striping, I'm setting up a wide data pipe, and if I'm doing lots of small I.O., then I'm shoving down just one pipe, and I'm only going to hit the first drive, probably, because of something called boundary alignment. So I'm pounding on the first drive, but the request isn't large enough to span across all the drives. But nobody can cut in line in front of me to get to the other drives. So once I start those little IOs, everyone else has to stand in line behind me. And then my IO wait times start going up. So you've got to be really careful about striping. It can hurt you more than help you. And half the time they get it right, and half the time they don't know any reason of what they're doing. You know, they're just saying, I got 128 drives, let's just put them together as a strike group without having measured with PAR what they're really doing on their system. Now I'm going to come back to striping and stuff like that later. So whether I'm using XLB or XBM, the concept is the same. The command line syntax to build them is different. And again, XBM is for CXFS but he eventually will be standalone. I think 10.0, they were going to say XBM would be standalone. You didn't need to have CXFS running. We also have the ability to have a log. We've already talked about the purpose of the log. It's keeping track of my INO directory metadata changes. The issue here now is when do I want to put an external log and why? So let's just talk about the scenario here. First of all, I would never care about the log if OS view is not showing any problems. Let me go back to my machine here. Uh, the, I can see metrics. Oops, sorry, it's temp. I don't have it anymore. PM info, capital T. I think I called it DAW, that's why. Take a little bit. Looks like it's just user time problems. What I was trying to get to here, while well, that report is coming out, there we are. Okay. So VI on my metrics that I just created, and there were these XFS metrics. Now the ones that matter to me when we're talking about the log are the ones that talk about log transactions. So there's a whole bunch of XFS statistics that have to do with transactions. This is the number of metadata transactions which waited to be committed to the on-disk log before allowing the process to continue. So if I start seeing that kick up, that means I've got processes waiting for the log to catch up to me. If I don't see that happening at all, I'm not going to worry about the log at this point. Now I could have a file system that uh, is a media-based video server, everything has been loaded, all the movies have been loaded on the server and everybody's just reading. In that situation, the inodes are not changing and I don't have a whole lot of metadata changes going on. So there's not going to be a whole lot of log activity to that situation. The other end of the spectrum would be like a news server. Every article posted in a news server has its own inode. The article number is the inode name. So as people around the world are posting articles to these news groups, I've got tons of metadata activity going on on a news server. So those are two different ends of the spectrum, a video server and a news server. Video server being large sequential reads, a news server being lots of little writes as well as reads. 
But you know what's more important on a new server? Reading the metadata, not the data. Because when I connect to it, I need to get to all the inodes. I don't read the article, but I do need to pull the inode information in to build my news groups and stuff. And we're going to take a look at a news server probably first thing tomorrow morning. So that was transactions synchronized. There's also asynchronous ones, which did not wait to be committed. Uh, number of times the transactions did not actually change anything. So those were a couple of the log statistics. And where I found them was OS view. Go to display five. Again, I do not have a good workload running right now. And where was it? Here we are. So right there. Again, I'm not in a real world situation. I don't have a real workload running. It's a bad time to look at the system. But going back to my story here, if this thing is starting to show activity that says that my log, disk log partition is not keeping up with the intensity of the metadata changes occurring, that's when I would start looking at externalizing the log. So there are a lot of cases out there, people will make it external and they don't even know or care whether it matters. Okay? So, if I don't care about the log, by default, the log is in the middle of the disk. It's in the middle of the partition. Now, why would they want to put the log in the middle? Go ahead. It's the shortest distance to any place on the disk. We're always halfway there. They're putting the log in the middle because we're always halfway there. Now, when do we care about that? When we're going there. When do we not care about it? When I don't have any log activity at all. Okay? So it makes sense in this situation, for example, bar spool news. Or bar spool MQ. Or send mail. These would be two different file systems that have lots of little heavy metadata activity to them. And it would make sense to put the log in the middle in those types of file systems. And it's still internal. Okay. Now somebody came along and made it external. This was a Cray person that did this. And in the Cray world, we had primary and secondary partitions. And they had the same concept 10 years ago. We put the log in the middle, but in this case, this was a Japanese person thinking primary, secondary partitions, and they put the log in the middle, but they made it external. It's the same. But then they got different performance. The reason was is they were running network curve. That's the thing they were stressing their file systems with. What's network here? File system backups, home directory backups. It ran twice as fast as internal because network were smart enough to have two streams, two readers coming off of that thing. So we had two I.O. streams coming off the disk rather than one. So that type of consideration might make sense in a home directory where you're doing file system backups or something. So again, it understands what is the nature of the I.O. that you're doing. Those questions that we had here, these kind of things are deciding that. And in the older days with Cray World, we'd see primary partitions here and then secondary partitions on each side. And I started seeing a lot of drives that had lots of head movement to them, lots of seeks. We could even count them in the Cray world. We don't in IRIX. So when would it be bad to put it in the middle? When I'm not changing any metadata, and when my primary delivery from the disk 
is real data, such as a video server. I don't want to skip over the log as I'm reading a video screen. That will cause a flicker. I'll drop frames and stuff. So, slash video might be a different story. We might want to put it at the begin or we might want to put it at the end. Now, which would be better? Beginning or end? We haven't, I talked a little bit about this, something called the zone bit drive. The zone bit drive, the hour tracks have more circumference to them, so they pack more sectors to it. And you start outer end, so this is zero and this is max. So as I'm going from the beginning, I'm just going to say this is zero and this is max on the drive. I'm going from the outer tracks to the inner tracks, which means my bandwidth here is less than the bandwidth on the outer tracks. Now the log is not a bandwidth requirement. So you would want to avoid putting the log at the beginning of the drive where you want bandwidth. The older IBM drives are at like 11 megabytes per second here and maybe 6 megabytes per second here. So do I want to put the movies on the 6 megabyte part of the drive or the 11 megabyte part of the drive? If you're going to split a drive up, you want to be aware of what's called a zone bit drive, CBR. And they pack different number of sectors, different geometries. So there's actually seven zones on these drives typically. So if I put the log at the beginning, I would be wasting bandwidth where my video movie could use it. I would be much better off putting the log here where I'm not wasting the bandwidth portion of the drive for something that won't take advantage of it because the size of the log reads and writes are very small. So in a video server where I just want the movie loaded, there's no changes going on, and every move, every room in the hotel is trying to read up that video stream, we want to skip over the log. Or I should say we want to avoid having to skip over the log. And there we want to try to get the file continuously allocated in the file system. So that my head's just streamed down the drive. Now, head movement. There is the ability in IRIX to track the head movement. It's part ash K. And with SPV, I was going to add one more plot that would show my head positions, and then I could actually see, for example, a find occur and watch it strip through the drive or something like that. But right now, you don't have a very good way of seeing how much head movement there is on the drive. The next option is a separate drive. What's the disadvantage of a separate drive? It costs more money. Drives are getting bigger. What do I do with the rest of the drive? So separate drives means money and wasted space. I got an 18 gig drive and I only need you know 10 meg or something for my log. I went to. Uh, Los Alamos, and they put all the logs on one drive. <laughs> of course, they had the mirror, but I think you can see the problem here now. If suddenly this was for bar school mail, thank you. Now suddenly I keep going to this portion of the log, and all the other file systems start having trouble keeping up, and that's where this can start kicking up again. Say, I can't commit, I can't get the data out of memory to the disk because the disk, disk heads are busy handling this other file system that had a, a spam attack on it. So not counting the reliability issue, this way is also interlocking your file systems. If you've got changes in inodes and directories going on. If I'm on video server, probably not because the inodes aren't changing. But if I'm writing or drawing or shrinking files, allocating or deallocating files, creating or destroying files, those would be bad situations. So when I got to Los Alamos and looked at their SAR data, one drive stuck out, looked at it, and it was all logs. And it was a very busy drive as the heads were moving around all the time. 
So if this isn't kicking up at all, I'm not going to worry about this. The other thing that you can do is, is with PS-L and the uh, casing name D option. The other day we saw an XFS INO log. There was a lock there for XFS. First time I encountered this, we had a uh, benchmark for University of Mexico, or Latin company, trying to compete against Sun and the Starfire. Uh, we were doing it in 40 minutes, they were doing it in 20 minutes. Same, same spam attack. Uh, it was about a 2K byte message to 20,000 users. Okay. When I ran the benchmark, watching with PS, I saw XFS log show up a lot. So if I'm doing PS and I see log locks with PS-L, that's what's actually causing this to start counting. So this is saying I can't commit to the thing, which means I hung on a log lock. So those would be two different reasons that I might, and I guess that we also see a number of log writes, number of blocks, and number of what's called IC logs, forces sleep. So there are some, like that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten metrics that relate to the log. And on this machine, they're all zero or empty. We just had a log force there. And again, even if I told you what the numbers were, which I can't remember exactly all of them, you go back to PM Info capital T and look up what the meaning of that particular is. If it's showing up a lot, figure out what it is. Now we're about done for the day here. So I just wanted to talk about the log, and in general I say leave it alone, but I try to give some examples and reasons that you might want to consider making it external. And it all goes back to the workload. So it makes sense to keep it internal on bar spool mail or bar spool news. Home directory, it might be okay to split it. Video directory, I put it at the end of the drive. And if I put it on a separate drive, I would want to put a dormant file system that's never used, like bar ADM crash or something like that there. And root, I'm probably not going to externalize it. It's more the uh, production file systems and home directory. So anyways, uh, to look at these partition layouts, print VTOC, DVH tool, FX, and one other one is XDKM. I don't know if you've seen this one. It is not loaded by default, but XDKM is a GUI much friendlier than FX. It's really nice. It does all the arithmetic that you need. You can specify things in megabytes instead of blocks and all that sort of thing. I've got a load that seems to be slowing uh, XDKM coming up. The uh, system still on. And by the way, if I do a versions, oops, there it is, and grep for XFS, let me just do it with that one. There's an XFSM. CLI and XFS M serve. Those are the two pieces you need for this. And they're not loaded by default. How do we go about getting that changed? So that they're loaded by default? I don't know. I would like to, there's an install standard. I'd like to see an install compute server or something like that. One that's going to load the XLB pieces, one that's going to load these two pieces, one that's going to load Miser. So you're right, it's not commonly loaded. There's no license involved in this, but it's just not on the system by default. Now this works distributed too. So I can run XDKM on my workstation and then select the particular host that I want to get to. And in this case, I'm just going to kick off S0D1, select that particular disk. I, I'm not running as, oh, I am running as root. But it says that that partition's currently in use. Partitioning it may result in loss of data. But I don't really care right now. I'm just looking at it. It happens to be an unused root. So in this example now, I see the host, the disk name. It's a SCSI disk, how big it is. I can display bad blocks. And then I can say partition it as a root, partition it as user, or partition it as option. And the option disk basically puts different stuff in the volume header. We 
We don't have FX and things like that in the volume header. And then over on the left, it's just easier to work with this, so I can specify it in blocks or megabytes. So there, I'm now working in megabytes. So I've got an XFS partition starting two meg into the drive, uh, eight gig in size, ending at that particular address, and then I have a raw slice, which was our swap, that was 128 meg in size. And then I see the volume header and the volume. And down here, when you're partitioning it up, this helps you make sure you don't have overlaps and then everything fits into the drive properly. It shows up as orange if you've got overlaps. And if you're missing, you can catch those things too. So I much prefer this than FX to work on a drive. And it'll fill in the end numbers for you, and you can cut and paste those into the beginning of the next partition. Yeah. So it, it derives the result here, and then you, you're, it's easier for you to basically pack it tighter. So that is a really good, I'm not going to apply or anything like that, but that is a good tool to know about. There's also an XFSM for making file systems. There's uh, also an uh, X, was it XLVM for the logic of volume manager, yeah. too. Three different GUIs, but the other GUIs I don't consider saving you that much, but the DKM one is really helpful. I mean, the other ones, you know, mounting and making, it, that isn't so bad. Okay. If you know how to do it, when you're XLVM teaching beginners. XLVM is pretty good for making striped volumes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier than sitting there trying to use XLV manager. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we now have a <coughs> disk align command that feeds its output into XLV manager to create your stripe configuration for you. Now that's where we're going to start off in the morning. So I'll write XDKM in there. Anyways, <clears throat> let's call it a day. Just before rebooting the system, opt and buff. So up till now, when we've been throwing IO loads at the system, the kernel has not grown much. We've got that in the SAR data that we're going to look at. Was that like 400 or something like that before? 400 buffers when we popped up above the field. Now it's like 50,000. We'll check. I just picked a big number. I can go all the way up to 600,000, and if I don't have enough memory, the kernel will say in this in the syslog, it's too big. It resets it down, and then it suggests that you clean that up. But it's not fatal if you make it too big. So there's nothing wrong with making NBuff as big as you can get it. This allows the kernel to breathe the whole things in buffer cache, and then buff view would show you what those things are in memory that are part of the buffer cache. So you can use buff view to decide are those files important or are they not important? You know, what am I doing on my machine? If a user comes along and wants memory, it can just push the kernel back down and take that memory back. Now, in 6.4, there were problems in that. So a lot of customers did not want to see large kernels. There was also occasionally memory leaks in the kernel heap that would take memory away. So customers would see those sorts of things occasionally, too. But there's nothing wrong with having a big kernel using memory as long as the users can take it back from the kernel. And that's something we're going to start looking for today and tomorrow when we start pressuring I.O. and memory. In the meantime, we want code 2 to still survive these service attacks. The objective was to protect code 2 from codes 3 and 4, for example. So we don't want code 4 to come into the system and cause code 2 to start swapping. And we don't want code 3 to come into the system and cause interactive response so bad that you can't do anything. Now yesterday it wasn't too bad, but we only had 400 buffers. And yesterday, it was like 20 buffers per file. When we looked at it for a while, there was the temp display, or temp files, and we saw the shuffling and stuff. So it was 20 or 30 buffers, but with an open system, it should be more like four or 500 buffers. But because there weren't that many, it had to share with all the other code threes that were running. And we didn't really look at the accounting data yet to see how long those code threes were waiting on I.O. 
So there's some data there in terms of CP weights and IO weights from the SP base experiments we haven't looked at. So I want to finish up file systems, then I want to go to CPU scheduling advisor, and then I want to start talking about file system buffer caching. And today into tomorrow is when we're going to get into the analogy of that fire bucket brigade again and talk about how our data being moved from user space to library buffers to kernel buffers and off onto the network or off onto the file system. So all these stopover points for my data have sizing decisions that you can make about them. For example, on the network for a web server, you can set the size of the buffer that you're reading the data in from the network larger. So common web server tuning guides will up that number. In fact, once I went from a uh, modem connection at home, the guy that set up my uh, Ethernet cable modem ran some scripts that also opened up the buffer sizes on my Windows system so that I could get better bandwidth across the network having larger buffers. Sizing these buffers is a matter of knowing what the nature of the I.O. is, and that goes back to PAR, R-S. There's also going to be PAR-K, we'll talk about that probably first thing tomorrow morning. So PAR-S shows what's going into the kernel, what the applications are asking the kernel to do. PAR-K shows what the kernel does to it. PAR-K showing what's coming out of the back end of the buffer cache. And those request sizes are all going to be sectorized based upon what XFS and buffer cache has done to the IO request but they have to be sectorized. Also, PAR-K is what's showing what's going to the volume manager. So all the numbers that are offsets into the file system are logical numbers that the volume manager is going to convert to the physical numbers. So all of our I.O. decisions go back to PAR. Now, if I know my market, I can recognize that video is going to be large and sequential I.O. I can recognize that credit card machines are going to be online transaction processing with lots of little I.O. So I can make some assumptions based upon the market. NAST ran is sequential I.O., uh, things like that. Car crashes are sequential I.O. And again, knowing these attributes, these are the things that we talked about yesterday. Knowing the I.O. patterns helps us decide what to do. But the bottom line is, is do I have a problem in the first place? So we're going to be talking about all the things that we can do about I.O., but if SAR and accounting data don't show me a problem, I'm not going to pursue that problem. So if SAR doesn't show I.O. wait time as a problem, I'm going to get away from that. If, uh, by the way, I was thinking, you know, the buff and the B.I.O. locks that were uh, shifting timings, I really brought my buffer cache real small down in size than I usually do. I usually go, uh, 5,000 or something like that. And I was thinking the other day that maybe because I made buffer cache down to 400, I've never gone that low, that that might have created the BIO lock to show up more than I'd seen before. Okay, Because the buffer cache was pressured so tightly. And our memory map up till now is going to show that that buffer cache hasn't changed much. Question? What I do is on 659 again. Oh, I forgot to set. Thanks. Got to set the change the route. I got that set root script. So those are some of the things I'm going to be watching for today as I pressure the system. But I want code two to survive all these pressures from buffer cache, from memory, from code threes and code fours. We haven't really looked at code one because that's middle of the road. I picked code three because it was bigger I.O. It moved more data per CPU second. I'm going to read what we do now with the uh, proper route. So we're kind of putting everything together today. And either at the end of today or tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about the system parameters that control the floors and the ceilings of the buffer cache portions that grow and shrink. NBuff is setting the ceiling for everything. Okay, but then there's floors. How far down do I push it? And I haven't changed those yet. But you see, NBuff requires a reboot. 
the other parameters do not require a reboot. They're, they're dynamic. So that's why I've done nbuff now, and the others I can play with as I need. And I'll show you how to push the kernel back down if you want. Okay. And that's using Sistune, setting a min file pages, or I'm sorry, a min free pages real small, and then setting back to where it was before. So we'll watch how that goes. So anyways, let's, uh, while we're waiting for the system to come up, we're in the middle of file systems. And I intend to look at not just do, but two other systems, maybe three real quickly today. One is an NFS server. One, it, another one is an NFS server with data migration. And the third one is a new server. Let's put these machine things down over here. I want to look at Clink, EFS, and Fido.Inger as production I.O. market machines. This one is NFS and uh, kernel builds. This one is NFS and DMF. And this one is a program called INN as a new server. It would be nice to have a media-based server to look at, too, and to have some data for. So these are some common type of I.O. markets. But with every one of them, it goes back to understanding the I.O. characteristics. The more you understand that, the better off you are.